Now, at least 17 people have been killed in a shooting at a high school in Florida. The gunman was identified as Nicholas Cruz, who previously attended the school and was expelled for unspecified disciplinary reasons. The firing took place shortly before dismiss dismissal at the Majory Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland. Just, I mean, my, I just can't imagine how their lives have been changed. Like all of us, we'll be praying for each of those. Everybody in the hospital, I pray for their uh, full recovery. All the individuals that unfortunately had to go through this experience, I know that there's going to be grief counselors, and I'm sure it's going to be very, very difficult as they think through what happened and, and replay in their mind what happened. I, I just can't imagine going through that. Uh, after... Uh, this uh, press conference, I'm going to be going to the hospital to do everything I can with those families. I've, I'm going to continue to let local law enforcement, the school district, everybody involved know whatever state resources are necessary, we will provide whatever resources are needed to do everything we can, either whether it's the investigation or help any family member uh, that's impacted. Um, again, I just, I just, this is just, uh, this is just pure evil. But I will be staying here in Broward County to do everything I can to be helpful. got a call from our Attorney General, Pam Bondi. Hours later, she's here. Um, she, sadly, when I was speaking to her privately, she knows all too well about these tragedies. She was in Orlando in the aftermath of the Pulse nightclub, and she's come down here to help the families uh, of those that lost loved ones. So I'm going to bring her up here to talk to you about some of the things that uh, the Attorney General is going to do for our families. Thank you, Sheriff. Sheriff, I cannot thank you, the governor, and the FBI. Rob, how you've handled this. You've been incredible. Superintendent, FDLE, all of the agencies working together. Um, it's a horrible tragedy, and sadly, we've been through this before. I was also out in Nevada for the mass shooting. In fact, one of the victims called me on the way here from the Nevada shooting and said, I can't believe this is happening again. She still has PTSD, and she was a survivor. The office, um, my office functions in a way, and this is what we're going to be doing. I have five advocates headed in right now. I will have at least ten more tomorrow driving in from all over the state. We will pay for the funeral expenses of these poor victims and do everything we can to help their families. The state of Florida, we will pay for counseling for the surviving victims. We will pay for students who need counseling. Um, we will have the forms. It's paperwork that just must have a page that must be filled out. We bring it to the victims' families so they can get it done right now. Don't have to worry about the expenses. We will take care of it. GoFundMe reached out to me already tonight. They've been pulling off anyone. If you think you're going to scam people during this tragedy, you're not. GoFundMe, they're monitoring every, every site that's popping up and no money will be dispersed to undergo fund me until they know it's legitimate. So if you are donating... And now, uh, bringing us more live update, uh, I'm joined in by our correspondent, Andy Rosgin from uh, Chicago. Andy, we just heard what the authorities had to say, including the sheriff and the attorney general. They are, needless to say, they are putting up a very brave front out there. What do you have to say to uh, that? Well, they are, and and that's really all they can say, because at this point, authorities are interviewing that gunman. And here's the, the, the strange kind of thing here, that we've had so many of these mass shootings. You heard uh, there mentioned uh, the shooting in Las Vegas and the Pulse nightclub. In those shootings and so many other shootings recently, the gunman has always died at the end. Uh, in this case, the gunman lived. Uh, and so he will be a wealth of information. Authorities will want to question him uh, for as long as they can to figure out why he did this. But I must say there was a treasure trove of social media uh, from this young man, 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz, that indicated that he was violent, that he threatened people and threatened animals. And his classmates are telling reporters there in Florida that uh, he was unstable, that he, that he was threatening, that he bragged about his uh, arms, his guns. Um, so a lot of people tonight are asking the question, how did this happen? How did nobody stop this young man before he went on this killing spree? 
a very very fair point made by you out there andy uh, you know you just mentioned that uh, he had been uh, sending out uh, the, these kind of messages on social me media. Do you think social media could be utilized, you know, uh, in monitoring uh, students in the school? Well, it, it is monitored uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, but it, it really starts with one person coming to law enforcement and saying, look, I'm seeing some posts from a, a guy that sounds kind of threatening. And that's why you heard from the sheriff today, again, imploring people, if you see something, say something, is what they always say here. Uh, that's often used in terms of uh, looking out for terrorists, but it's equally valid here. And so the sheriff was saying, look, you know, if, if, you, if you see something on social media that is, is scary, that's threatening, um, you should come and, and alert authorities. And in fact, the school in this case, Douglas High School, where this shooting occurred, they were aware of threats from this young man. In fact, they put out a warning uh, saying that if you see this young man coming near the school wearing a backpack, uh, you should alert authorities. So people knew about him. But still, nothing was done, and uh, this All right. is the result. Andy, I'm also joined in by Steve uh, right now. Let me also cut across uh, to Steve and uh, get his viewpoint on this subject. You also, uh, you know, pointed out to a very valid uh, fact that, you know, the school authorities were already aware of this. So, Steve, what do you have to say? Uh, don't schools now uh, have a larger responsibility in terms of, you know, monitoring the security of the students since they, over here in this case in point, you know, they were already aware when uh, the this particular ex-student had been putting threats out there on social media. Yeah, that's right. We do understand that there had been uh, some history there, that that's one of the avenues that investigators uh, are looking at, whether or not, uh, you know, there had been some red flags uh, that had been raised. Not only the, the issue of social media, but of course the AR-15 rifle that he had, the multiple magazines. Uh, there's going to be questions, of course, asked about how uh, this uh, suspect managed to uh, obtain that kind of firepower and then get it inside the school. You know, social media, it's not only uh, the suspect's social media, use that people are going to be looking at. One of the uh, questions or one of the things that the FBI is telling uh, the survivors of this shooting to do is to hand over any video, any Snapchat video, any Instagram video, that kind of thing to them so that they can use that not only to piece together uh, what they think uh, may have occurred but, and, and, and to get a timeline, uh, but also to sort of put together, uh, you know, future safety protocols to try to find out, you know, right. what was happening in what part of the school at one particular time uh, and maybe they can use that, uh, you know, to, to, to try to improve security. Right. Uh, Steve, I'm also being told that you're very close to the location where the shooting actually took place. Could you throw light on the modus operandi of the entire shooting? I'm sorry, could you repeat that for me one more time? Uh, Steve, I'm being told you are live currently from a location very close to where the shooting actually took place. Could you inform our viewers about the entire modus operandi when the, when the shooting was on? Yeah, that's right. Well, what we understand, we know a couple of things about the timeline uh, of when this took place. The first thing to note is that this is a very large school. We understand that the school is something uh, in the region of 3,000 students there, about uh, just uh, uh, an hour or two to the north of Miami. Uh, what we can tell you is that around 2 o'clock local time, uh, we understand that the fire alarm was triggered inside the school. And many of the students say that was somewhat strange because there had been a fire alarm just a little bit earlier in the day uh, and that had been a standard fire drill. The students did what they needed to do. They left their classrooms. They went outside uh, as they're supposed to do. So when a second fire alarm happened, uh, they were somewhat surprised uh, about that. Uh, and what we understand, what police suspect, uh, is the suspect then is believed uh, to have opened fire once students had left their classrooms and had gone into the corridors or left uh, the school building itself. And that's interesting because a lot of schools have these what they call shelter-in-place uh, trainings where students are taught to stay in their classrooms uh, when it's rumoured or when it's believed that there is an active shooter on the premises to barricade the classrooms, to lock those doors. Uh, that is one of the things that teachers are trained to do as well. So uh, it seems to be one of 
of the avenues of questioning that the police are looking at at the moment is, uh, was there some attempt by triggering that fire alarm uh, to increase the number of casualties inflicted in this mass shooting? Now, the suspect in this case, of course, uh, has been taken into custody, Nicholas Cruz, and that is one of the lines of investigation we understand that police are following uh, to try to determine uh, some kind of motive. The other thing we can tell you about this suspect and uh, the, the search for an investigation and his method of operation is that many of these students uh, say that they recognized him. Of course, he was a uh, former student of this school, although 19 years old, still uh, enrolled in Broward County Schools, the local area school district here. So it wasn't a surprise to many of these students to see him uh, at the school, uh, and it didn't raise any alarms to them. It wasn't something that they would have thought to report. So uh, again, uh, there's some kind of indication that maybe this was a planned attack, that this had taken some strategizing, and that's something that the police are going to be looking into right. as well. Uh, Steve, you just mentioned that it was a planned attack. And, uh, you know, we can only speculate at the moment since the authorities have not confirmed anything. But uh, from your sources, what is your information that could hint at the motive of this attack? Well, that's a very good question, and that, of course, is the uh, you know the fifty thousand uh, dollar question at this point. Uh, you know, police are being very uh, mum about it. Uh, you could see it, say at the moment, uh, you know, the suspect was detained uh, just a short distance uh, from the school in a in a community nearby. Police had investigated reports that he would tried to get away in the melee, if you like, as students were leaving the school. Uh, that he, in fact, uh, had tried to blend in with the crowd. He didn't get very far, uh, and that's one of the things that police are going to be looking into is, you know, exactly what uh, his motive was. And this is something that police have a lot of experience with, both on a local level and also on the federal level. Florida, of course, itself is not new uh, to mass shooting events. The Pulse nightclub shooting, which claimed the lives of 49 people, uh, took place in Orlando, just uh, a little bit to the north of where I'm speaking to you from right now. Uh, and, of course, we also had, just very close to here, a shooting that took place last year at the Fort Lauderdale International Airport. Uh, so in instant where the suspect is taken into custody, that can be valuable for police in trying to piece together uh, a motive. Oftentimes, uh, the alleged shooter dies uh, either in a shootout with police uh, or takes their own life. In this instance, that didn't happen. And that's going to be critical uh, to police trying to figure out uh, exactly what his motive was. And as you were mentioning, uh, his online habits, what he'd been posting on social media, the kinds of videos he'd been looking at uh, on YouTube. Uh, reports had merged that uh, he'd been looking at videos uh, that could have had to do with bomb making, for example. Uh, that's going to be something they're going to be looking at as well. So a whole array of motives. It's very early uh, in the investigation at the moment. We're just a few hours out from the shooting, but certainly police in this area at the moment combing through that school, looking for any evidence. And that is where, uh, you know, the video part of it comes in uh, as well. See if they can find out something to do with the motive. Right. Uh, Steve, I'm going to have to request you and Andy both to hang in there. We will come back to you as we track this story. And for all our viewers who are just tuning into this bulletin, over 18 incidents of shootings have been reported on school campuses across the United States in the last two months. It's Itself. Let us take a look at some of them. Beginning with the latest incident at Florida High School, where a former student opened fire, killing 17 people before authorities took him into custody. On 5th of February, a student was shot at, at on the campus of a school in Oxon Hill, Maryland, during an alleged disagreement between two parties. A 32-year-old man died after being shot twice in the leg during a fight in the parking lot of a school in Philadelphia on 31st January. And just seven days before that incident, a 16-year-old boy opened fire at Marshall County High School in Benton, Kentucky, killing two and injuring 18 others. Ending and... Now I'd like to actually uh, cut across back to uh, Andy and Steve and get their take on this uh, story that we, are uh, we actually continue to track, the latest shooting in Florida. Um, Andy, uh, this shooting is the 18th incident in a U.S. school, you know, uh, and nationwide debate is already on. I'll keep coming back to you. You know, we can track these criminals. We can track the killers. We can go on and find out, you know, about their motive. But how do you look at the larger picture, at the larger scenario in the United States? 
the, the chatter around the U.S. is what it always is after these uh, shootings, um, which is uh, those who support gun control are howling tonight, saying, how can we let this happen again? How do we let this happen again? How can we call ourselves uh, an exceptional nation, a first world power? And yet we're seeing these things that don't happen anywhere else except maybe Iraq or Syria, these mass killings. How does this happen? So as always will be the case, uh, gun control supporters will demand legislation. That will probably go nowhere as it has many, many times in the past. Those who support gun rights, well, tonight they are largely being silent as they usually are after these incidents. They're saying, look, it's not the time to talk about gun control. It's the time to grieve for the victims. Gun control supporters will say, of course, that's wrong. Now is the time to talk about gun control. So the debate will rage and rage and rage. Um, I, I will say that when it comes to mass shootings, we had the one in Las Vegas. We had the one last year at the nightclub in Orlando. But shootings that happen in a school tend to touch a raw nerve. Uh, nerves get especially afraid by that because a school is where you send your kids off to and assume they'll be fit, safe. So gun control supporters uh, will certainly feel like this gives them more ammunition, so to speak, and I'm sorry to use that uh, uh, analogy, but more weight to their argument that we need gun control. And this gentleman, uh, Nicholas uh, Cruz, uh, carried out his attack apparently with an AR-15 assault weapon. And there have been many people saying that we should go back in this country to the days when assault weapons were banned. That ran for 10 years from 1994 to 2004. Um, so that question will certainly come up again. But I must say that with, with as polarized as this nation is, it's hard to imagine real meaningful gun control legislation actually happening. Right. Uh, Andy, also, I'd actually like to go across to Steve right now, who's uh, reporting live from the location in Florida. Uh, Steve, we, uh, we just, you know, getting visuals coming in live uh, of the school. It's a regular school building, as we can all see. And, uh, you know, it's actually tragic as uh, Steve actually uh, pointed out that, you know, um, when such incidents take place in places like schools, you know, it actually touches a very raw nerve. And uh, we can see this is just one of those regular school buildings. These are live visuals coming in from the Florida High School where the shooting actually took place. Uh, Andy, I'd like you to elaborate on uh, this, you know, uh, and tell our viewers about the entire incident, how it took place uh, around the time of dismissal. Uh, Steve just informed us how uh, the fire alarm went, uh, you know, out. You just informed us that the fire alarm just went out shortly before the dismissal happened. Right. And that was an indication, certainly, that this was a very well planned out attack. And uh, based on his social media accounts, uh, as Steve was saying, Nicholas Cruz uh, was no stranger to certainly talking about violence. So it looks like he certainly planned this out with a lot of planning. He uh, right. went into the school with the gas mask and the, the smoke bombs uh, to set off. Uh, also, and then, Andy, let yeah. me also get in um, Steve's opinion out here since he's reporting live from the location in Florida. Steve, over to you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the school. This is a very large school, uh, about 3,000 students, as I understand it, uh, in the Miami suburbs. And let me tell you something about this. Uh, this isn't the first school shooting that I've covered. Uh, I covered the, uh, the uh, Columbine uh, high school shooting uh, in Denver uh, back in the uh, 1990s. And this is a problem that has plagued schools in the United States uh, for an extremely long time. I've also covered over the years uh, what schools are doing now, the kinds of measures that they're taking as a matter of course on a regular basis uh, to try to A, avoid this kind of thing from happening, but B, uh, to respond to them uh, when they take place. You know, a lot of places, including here in Broward County, but many counties uh, across the uh, country, across this state and across the country Steve, have Steve, sort of nerve centers, Steve, places I where would like there you... are people monitoring uh, the schools, a bank Steve, of monitors where they... Steve, I'd like you to, uh, you know, yeah. also inform our Indian viewers out here about what are the security measures, and since you just mentioned that, what are the security measures that the schools in the U.S. are taking? And particularly, if your sources have informed you, were there any school, uh, you know, security measures taken by this particular high school? 
Yeah, that's right. Like most major high schools uh, here in the U.S., this, and in fact, not even major high schools. I was in a high school uh, just last week that was quite small, just a, a few hundred students. And even those schools have cameras dotted around the place, in the classrooms, in the corridors, uh, and around the perimeter of the school to make sure uh, that there isn't anybody in the sort of the vicinity of the school uh, that shouldn't be there. Some schools in large urban areas, uh, in fact, have metal detectors that students have to go through to try to uh, find out whether or not they have weapons, that kind of thing, and that, of course, uh, would be triggered if somebody had tried to bring an AR-15 into the school. We understand that the student was able to uh, bring that gun and several magazines into the school. But those cameras feed back to control centers, and in those control centers, you have people throughout the school day monitoring those uh, pictures coming in. Uh, they'll take pictures, for example, throughout the day of the parking lot, making sure uh, that the cars that come and go from that parking lot are not suspicious, they don't loiter, that they're recognizable people that are coming in. Uh, many of these schools also have what they call community resource officers. These are police officers that are employed uh, by the, uh, the sheriff's department, usually sometimes by the city police, and they're positioned in schools. And the, a school of this size, about 3,000 students, is certainly one of those schools where you would expect to have one of those school resource officers there. And that officer is trained to respond particularly uh, to this kind of incident in recent years. They're there uh, to notice anything suspicious. Uh, they're there to uh, try to, you know, figure out or, or, you know, get gossip, if you like, because obviously schools are hubs of gossip. You know, is something going to be going on to get to know these kids? So these are all things that these schools are doing these days to, you know, to, tr to, to try to stave off this kind of attack. But obviously, uh, as we've seen today uh, here in Parkland, Florida, so far it hasn't been successful. Right, Steve. Um, thank you so much for bringing us that information. Steve and Andy, I'd like to thank you both for speaking uh, to us right now. Of course, our discussion has raised some very, very valid questions which need to be answered, and we'll continue to track that story.